should be working. I'll just hold it go. close to my face. <laughs> um, so we've got a, a panel discussion for you this morning about uh, cartography as a small business. Before we start off with that, there's a couple of housekeeping announcements that I have to make. Um, there are still atlases of design available, so if you want to place an order, just select it to be picked up here and you can get it at the registration desk. There's also still t-shirts left, including some in these smaller sizes. So if you have any children or grandchildren <laughs> or nephews or nieces that you really like, hint, hint. And remember, all of the proceeds of the t-shirts go towards the student travel <laughs> grant. So you are really doing a good thing. You get a nice t-shirt and you get that warm, fuzzy feeling that you're helping students. Um, so um, in this panel discussion, we've got four great panelists. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a moment. Um, if you have any questions, um, either raise your hand uh, so I can come to you with the microphone or come up to the microphone that we have at the front here. And uh, yeah, I think it's about time for introductions. All right. Is this loud enough? Okay, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Erin. Um, my company is just Erin Greb Cartography. I work by myself in my house, so very small, small business, <laughs> and most of the work that I do is um, contract work for you know, other people. I don't have a product that I sell. Um, it is a wish that I have, but you know, most of the time it's uh, you know, getting contracts, small jobs, some bigger jobs, and um, I've been doing this for 10 years. I worked for MapQuest and Penn State Geography for five years before going out on my own, but um, this year is my 10-year anniversary working by myself. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Uh, my name is Derek Tun. I'm the founder and CEO of MapFormation LLC. Uh, I worked in higher ed for seven years in the 1990s, and my hobby job or my passion project was campus maps, and I did campus map illustration for the two universities that I worked for, not thinking of it as a potential career. Uh, but all of a sudden, I was getting a lot of word of mouth referrals, people saying, well, who did your university's map? They give them my name, and then pretty soon I was to the point where I had about 40 hours a week of hobby job work. And my wife put her foot down and said, you are not going to have two full-time jobs. Pick one, I don't care which, but either work for a university or make maps for a living. So in 2000, I decided I would make maps full-time for a living, and I've been at it now 18 years. Uh, map formation started out as just me. We're now to the point we have 12 illustrators working in our shop. We do work for about 550 clients in 10 time zones, maybe about 350 universities, and then about 200 uh, either corporations or government agencies doing a lot of tourism work. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. I'm Dennis McClendon. Uh, in 1994, after coming to NASIS for a few years and sort of pondering the possibilities of uh, starting a custom cartography shop a little uh, in Chicago, um, uh, one day my uh, boss at my day job told me that I was about to have that opportunity. Uh, it was about it was my last day, and uh, so. Uh, so I decided to give it a try and almost immediately uh, landed a good uh, uh, client that uh, gave me uh, sort of the wings to get going on that. So about uh, 24 years later, I'm still doing that. Um, first half of those 24 years, I had uh, an employee at one point, even two, but uh, especially after the Great Recession, uh, a lot of retrenchment in the real estate industry, which was uh, a big part of my client base in the old days. And uh, so now I also am just working from home, closed my office, got rid of thousands of uh, maps and books. <laughs> that was uh, kind of painful. And uh, do uh, odds and ends for various clients, including university presses, uh, tourism clients in Chicago. I do have uh, a big transit uh, map uh, client uh, and just whatever else comes in over the transom. There's the and help for uh, oh, we have a longer cord. Uh, we, we have the right kind of cord. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Nat Case. Um, my company is I N Case LLC. I is Ingrid, Nat N is for me. Um, my wife likes to say we're not just married, we're incorporated. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, actually, I'm at NASIS because of Dennis. Uh, Dennis uh, told me to come to the St. Paul NASIS in 1992. And, uh, 
then eight years later, I started coming regularly. Um, so I uh, started working uh, at Hedberg, well, at the company that became Hedberg Maps in 1991, um, which was a small business for its, uh, it's, it's still running. Um, it had no more than five employees at its peak, I think. Um, that I helped start as a map publishing company that transitioned into mostly being a, a custom map company as map publishing started to become less of a, uh, of a going concern uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, I went freelance in 2013 uh, and uh, so my wife and I have a small business. She's an editor and writer and I'm, uh, I make maps and do design and, and uh, geo, uh, geo research for whoever wants to pay me to do it. Uh, we're basically incorporated so we don't have to argue about whose fax machine it is um, or whose printer. Um, and that's because that's it. Right, I'd like to start off the discussion with a question that came in through Twitter. Um, we have members who can't be here who are following the live stream, so hi Nani. Um, the question is, um, what is your checklist of questions or a needs assessment uh, to ask customers before starting a map? There's been misunderstandings. I think we've all been there, and obviously it's in everybody's best interest to avoid those. So what do you use? So I'll start. Um, I think the, the two huge questions are, when do you need it? Um, I mean, sometimes you ask what's your budget, or sometimes you approach it, this is how much it'll cost, can you afford that? Um, but yeah, m money and time are the two major ones that I ask up front. Um, you know, if I'm really busy, I don't want to waste my time, and so I'll say, I'm busy for the next two months. If you need this before then, you know, I'll give you a suggestion of someone else to go with. Um, so I'll say those are my two major ones in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, maybe to add to that, I would, get, I would say one of the things I like to ask all of our clients is who's the end audience? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be using this map? And then uh, trying to decide how to make the map uh, the most effective it can be for the audience that's uh, being pursued. Like we have some clients, they're saying we need a great map that's going to appeal to 13 to 15 year old students who might consider coming to college here one day. You have other maps where somebody might say this is for an audience of 50 to 60 year olds who might be looking to be potential donors. A uh, very different audience, so a very different approach maybe on how we're going to create that illustration. Uh, the other thing that we'll always ask is uh, the medium uh, that they need to have the maps uh, produced onto print signage or on screen kind of what's their priority, and everyone always says, you know, do you want print signage or on screen? And the answer is yes, we want it on all three, but which is kind of the primary driver that you're after to have uh, kind of this map produced and to be presented in the most effective way. And if someone says, I need this to be a 34 by 22 inch sign that's going to be outside of a main visitor parking area, that's a, a bit different project than somebody who wants something that looks great at 1500 pixels on a screen. Uh, so we always ask those types of questions just to try and better define or refine how we're going to be producing the illustration for them. So in addition to getting the business aspects of uh, deadline and um, what this is probably going to cost out of the way, um, very, I'm very focused on print production and so uh, I have five uh, very general things that I want to know before I start work. Um, first of all, what's the size of the map? and what's the extent that the map should cover. Uh, then uh, what features are we going to be showing on this map? Um, what's the color space, uh, grayscale or, or full color? Uh, uh, generally, the answer uh, it's CMYK for me, but uh, occasionally there's people that will be wanting it also for the web. And uh, is there a color palette? so that this map can look like it belongs to the rest of the publication that you're in. And then similarly, is there a typeface palette that it can look like it belongs to the book that you're uh, creating? Unfortunately, with a lot of um, uh, work, especially for university presses, it's much too early for them to know anything about the design of the book that it's going in. And so we end up uh, just having to make generic choices on everything. Uh, and, uh, and of course, clients will just say, oh, I don't care, just uh, make it an aerial, whatever. <laughs> I 
think they've covered most of the most of the items. Um, <clears throat> A couple of refinements on what, the, on what they've said. When it comes to budget, one of the things that I often do is um, because everyone kind of has a default idea that whoever names a price per, first loses. Uh, that's kind of a, a rule that a lot of people absorb from business. Um, what I'll often do is once they've described the outline of the project, I say, well, that's a, a it can be a four hundred dollar project or a ten thousand dollar project, mm -hmm. um, and uh, what. How, how deluxe do you want this to be? Uh, and sometimes I'm su surprised and they say, well, I, th we want this to be really, really good. What's 10,000 gonna get us? Um, and those are, those are great when those, those projects come. <laughs> um, both because they're well paying, but also because it means I get to really do a good meaty job on, on really go to town on a project. Um, supplementing the color and font thing, uh, I ask about style because a lot of times uh, particularly for historical stuff, people will want to have a nudge towards hist. I mean, they don't want it to be a, a, a faux, uh, a, a you know, a, a fake, a, 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 a fake or, or faux style, but they want to have a nudge towards whatever era it's in. Um, and so that's that's been a fruitful. I think I think often the checklist of questions is not so much to to fill in the blanks and, and the thing, but to start the conversation on a variety of fronts so that you don't assume anything. Um, and the style is often a way to start a conversation they may not have even considered. I think I want to add something that a lot of, like, I will always say, you know, this is what my estimate is for a project. Once they give me the information, they do a lot of work also for university presses, and I always encourage the client to give me, you know, any information they can up front because there are a lot of times where they might see the map and they'll see, oh, there's all this blank space. Could you also add these 30 labels to the map? Or could you also do this? And so I always have it stated very clearly that if the map changes along the way, along the draft process, you know, if it changes drastically from the original concept of the, um, of the map, then there will be a price change. So I always make sure to say that and so I don't get um, stuck in a situation where I just keep doing more and more and more work. Um, so I just, yeah, I encourage them to give me as much as they can, know what they actually want, and not figure it out along the way with me. I can add one more thing. I, it's good to be able to gauge, uh, gauge fairly early in the process what kind of client they are in terms of knowing what they know, what do they know about maps. Uh, and after you've done it for a while, you can pretty quickly gauge that. And if there's someone who doesn't know what they want, um, it's really helpful and makes a great client relationship to be able to talk them through the stuff they haven't thought of because they're like, oh, I had no idea that that was a, an issue. Um, and that can be anything from area of coverage to style to do you really want to put 5,000 names on a postcard size map um, and, just, and helping them problem solve. Um, both, I mean, and, and sometimes with, with clients, um, when it's a really turns out to be a really complex problem, I'll say, okay, we've just spent half an hour on this. From here on, I need to charge a consulting fee to help you figure out what it is that you need. Uh, and we'll do it as a two-stage, you know, $200, $300, $300 to, to formulate what we're going to do, and then we'll be able to get you a quote and know how many maps you need and know what they're going to be and what they're going to cost. So from my personal experience on, on this particular subject, um, some of the questions I most often ask my clients are, diplomatic versions of, are you sure? And are you sure you're sure? Um, so uh, coming back to Aaron, um, with uh, changing requirements during the project, and I'm sure as we all know, some changes to the map are easy to do and don't really take a whole lot of time, and some of them look like they're easy but actually take a whole lot of time. How do you communicate that with your client? Well, I, I just had this come up a couple of weeks ago, uh, doing a map of uh, uh, shortline railroads in Northern California, and uh, after he sees the draft, the uh, author says, oh, uh, you know, it, I, I didn't realize I really need to show all the way down to uh, Vallejo. And, um, and, and so, to, uh, the, at least my workflow, kind of the, the way that I had done all this stuff on the arc map side before transferring it over and then really making it very nice in Illustrator. And I just had to say to him, well, if we really go back and 
uh, change the scale in order to do that. Um, I think what is currently, you know, an $800 project is going to become a $1,000 project. Uh, maybe we have plenty of room over in Nevada. How about if I show an inset uh, over there? And so that was the way that he chose to go. Um, do we have, let's get our audience involved. Um, can I just see some hands uh, who is currently uh, like on the brink of maybe starting their own business? Do we have anybody? Hmm. Turn us? back, turn back. <laughs> it's not too late. Do you have any other advice than don't do it to, to those people? <laughs> yeah, I, um, I don't, I don't, I don't. In the past, office environments in me didn't work very well. I, I love working by myself. I mean, I, it was, I did like the fact that in an office environment, you know, working with other people, there, there is that collaborative effort. Um, but for me, I mean, working for my own, there's a lot of freedom. You know, I can, I can choose who I work for and choose my own hours. Um, for me at the time, it was helpful because I did have a child, so it did allow me to have more flexibility with my family life, but there's definitely a lot of risk. You know, there are some years where my income is a lot less, and then the next year it might be double what it was that year. So you really just have to plan for those bad years and really be, um, you know, think every year about, you know, save a certain amount of money. I mean, there's all kinds of things to worry about. Um, but for me, the, the benefit of the f uh, flexibility definitely is, uh, you know, more than the risk involved. Thanks. I, for me, what was really important was uh, a gradual transition into being self-employed. I, maybe I wasn't courageous enough, but I thought just yelling cannonball and jumping off the cliff or diving board into the, into the big ocean or the pool was too scary because going from a steady paycheck every two or four weeks with benefits, you get vacation time, you get sick pay, to being where you are completely on your own. And if you don't get a check for six or eight weeks, you gotta make ends meet. Uh, so that being said, for me, it was really important to kind of slowly wade out into deeper water before making uh, kind of that cold turkey commitment. I think I had mentioned in my introduction, I spent seven years doing kind of freelance or consulting work before I actually went full time doing nothing but mapping work. And for me, that was just a much safer, more responsible way to go. I'm married, I have two daughters. And I didn't want to put our family kind of in that financial position of how are we going to pay our bills next month. Uh, so I, I gradually kind of worked my way into it. I think, I think for me, one of the most important things that I need to remind myself of every day, every week, every month, is if you try and be an expert at everything, you won't be an expert at anything. Uh, and a lot, I think the danger for a lot of people who are in business for themselves are I can do my own marketing, I can make my own website, I'm going to do my own books, I'm going to buy a copy of Quicken and I'll take care of my books and I'll do my own taxes. I'll, I'll go online and I'll fill out my paperwork to, to create an LLC. I'll do, I'll do all of these tasks that are everything but why you're starting your mapping or cartography business. <laughs> but you have to remember that if you try and become an expert at all of those different things, you're really taking time away from what you're really probably uh, have the most expertise at doing and the reason why you're starting the company to begin with. So what I've done with our business is I try and focus on the things that I am really good at, where I am stronger than most of the people around me, and then I bring in people who are stronger than me at other areas. Like in our shop, we always joke, like, I'm a vector illustrator. You don't want me creating a map for you in Photoshop or doing a ton of InDesign work or using Trimble SketchUp. I've got other people who are 10, 20, 50 times better than me using those different tools. Let them do what they're great at. I'll do what I'm great at, and hopefully all boats rise. I know the danger, though, is if you're in business for yourself, you're just a one-person shop. You're thinking, I'm going to save money. I'm just going to do it all myself. But there's a cost to doing it yourself, trying to do all of those things without help from others who might have a much greater expertise than you do. Um, I think one of the, I mean, I was thinking about this, this panel uh, over the last few weeks, and one of the, 
uh, sort of ordinary questions that comes up is, well, what do you mean by small business? Uh, there's, there's a ton of variation between someone who has a full-time job and is working part-time making maps on the side to someone who has a 10-person operation and is bringing in half a million dollars and has an office and equipment and is making a, making a product and, and has inventory. Um, and I think one of the scary things about actually owning your own business is that's probably going to change. Um, and Hedberg Maps started out as a map publishing company. We published product and we sold it through retailers, uh, distributors, we had inventory, we had printers, we, had, we were set up as a business to sell to be a publisher. Um, and then, and it still is, Hedberg Maps still does publish maps. Um, but that balance, the, the, the market for street maps is pretty much vanished at this point. Um, and it was a slow slide out of that. Um, who your client base is will affect what work you do. What work you do will affect your client base, um, which will affect whether you have employees or not employees. Do you outsource and what do you outsource? Does your skill set change? You, you didn't think you were good at marketing and here you are making marketing, marketing materials to 10 years later. So being willing to go with the flow but also manage the flow and be aware of what it is so that you aren't you aren't surprising yourself with being caught off balance or depending on your you know, you're spending 20 hours doing something you hate doing but here you are doing it anyway um, I think that applies to any any small business um, regardless of what industry you're in but um, certainly it's true in the map business In the audience at this point? Good morning. This one on. Um, pricing. I'm a little unusual in that all my maps are hand drawn and one off, so I have a, an original that is for sale and then print. So I, <clears throat> I price by complexity, which is a really weird thing to price by. Um, I can't price by hours and I can't price by project, so I'm just questioning. Do you have a strict price, or does it depend on who's coming, and do you price by the hour, project, number of prints, and, or any advice on that? For me, it depends on the client. I have, I have some book publishers that require me to have an hourly rate. Um, sometimes it's hard to do that because, you know, I might be a lot more efficient than somebody else you know, working on the same map with the same hourly rate, and so the price of the map in the end turns out differently, and so I just, you know, I, I, I end up looking at the maps that I need to make for them. It might be a giant series for a book, and I'll say in my head, well, that would cost me, like in my mind, I usually do um, estimate per project. Um, and you know, sometimes the hourly rate ends up being a lot less than others in the end. Um, but yeah, complexity, it's, it's how complex is the map? Is it going to take a long time to do research in the beginning or are they just giving me like a one page Word document with 20 places to label? That's, you know, it's, I think just over the years I can look at a source map, I can look at a list of labels and I just can say to myself, oh, that's a $200 map, that's a $500 map. And over time you just develop those skills, but with yeah, the, the really complex ones, they're, they're a bit harder to, to estimate and so, but yeah, I, I do it by project for the most part. Two things related to pricing. Um, one of the really surprising things to me after I started the business, once we had a portfolio to share with clients, is I would, I would show people our work and they'd be very polite, smiling, oh, that's, that's beautiful, very nice. And, and then they wouldn't really respond to, like the sales lead would kind of end. And I finally got brave after a couple of years of having all of these, what I thought were somewhat promising leads that just kind of turned into dead ends. And I asked some of the people, well, I thought you were interested, and I'm much more professional and polite than this, but I thought you were interested, you know, kind of what happened. And they said, oh, we love your work, but we could never afford you. And I'm like, we haven't talked price. <laughs> you're, you're, making the, you're making the assumption that you can't afford us based upon the work that you're seeing. So from that point forward, every initial lead that I've received in our business for probably 15 years, the first thing they receive when they receive my first polite, you know, it was great talking with you, it was great meeting with you, it 
love to have the opportunity to work with you in the future. But that first response or that first communication they receive from me includes, here's what it would cost to produce this type of map for your organization so that I eliminate that, that idea of, oh yes, you have beautiful work, but we could never afford you. Uh, they can see almost like what I do for, especially for uh, higher education projects, if we're creating campus map illustrations for universities, we have a number of different styles that we produce. And what I do is I prepare almost like a one-page restaurant menu style estimate saying, if you're interested in this type of map, here's the timelines and costs. If you're interested in this type of map, timelines and costs. So they can see an array of different styles of services that we can provide along with the different timelines and costs associated with it. So right away they say, oh, aha, well, we could never afford this one, but we're kind of like this one, and we could certainly afford that, and it meets our timelines for our project. But I tried to cut that question or that problem off at the knees right away. The second thing I've done, and this may seem counterintuitive as well, but I have not quoted an hourly price for our work in probably 15 years. I quote a project fee, like somebody says, I'm interested in doing a map for the city of Norfolk, a tourism project. We'll give them kind of a one, a one number not to exceed fee. And you say, well, that's lunacy, because what if it turns into, you thought it was a 200-hour 200 200 project, now it's become a 250-hour project, you're losing your shirt per hour. <laughs> I almost think of it as a mutual fund strategy. Clients like when they can keep it simple. Uh, and they don't want us, and they don't know that something costs three hours here and takes five hours there. All they want to know is how much is a map going to cost me, and when can I have it? So it's almost like a mutual fund uh, in our pricing strategy. We know from doing hundreds or thousands of maps for hundreds of clients, this type of project should be about this many hours, and if our illustrators want to be paid roughly X per hour, we need to quote Y in fees. Uh, to make sure they're making their per hour rate. Some jobs you come out ahead and make out like a bandit. You thought it was a 200 hour job and it took 150, so you're per hour, you're like, yes. Other jobs, you thought it was 200 hours, it comes out at 250, you're like, ugh. <laughs> but overall, kind of the average, kind of how, how is your return across all of your projects for over the course of a year? And that's what we try and focus on to keep it simple for our clients, because clients want simplicity and they don't want to feel nickel and dime. Uh, Daniel Huffman has been uh, surveying some of us in this last year, and I think he posted the results on his blog about uh, okay <laughs> about uh, pricing uh, that freelancers charge. Um, I I don't like hourly rates. I do have a public client that uh, uh, that's the only way that I can get the job is to quote an hourly rate and. Uh, as long as there's no one from the Illinois State Inspector's Office in the audience, I'll say that uh, that is quoted at a very low hourly rate, and then they are uh, billed at a, uh, an efficiency uh, uh, multiplier. Uh, 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 yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> I would much rather just conceive, uh, you know, that's a one-page map. One-page maps kind of have an amount of detail in them that uh, is not going to vary dramatically and so I just tend to think of those as $350 maps and based on the conversation you know it may go up or down a little bit based on that or if they're doing six variants of essentially the same base map obviously not going to pay the full freight for every one of those but uh, I just prefer to kind of think of it oh this is a, a so many hundred dollar project uh, that will fill a day or even a day and a half rather than I, I'm just not granular enough to think of it in terms of an hourly rate. So. I think it varies also by the type of project and the type of client. Um, when I'm doing geodata research work, uh, the projects tend to be very large and potentially open-ended. Uh, basically, take this data set and make it better. Here's some, here's some ways you want to make it better. Um, and those I build on an hourly uh, basis. Uh, and basically, it's how much you, how much can you get done? Yeah, you know, I, I have, I have x, x hundred hours to make the project, make the database as much better as I can, uh, given that time. And those are relationships that depend on a fair amount of trust with the 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 contractor, with the contracting client, um, which I have. They know me, I know them, and that's that's 
kind of depends on that. On that, it, it's like having an employee essentially, except I'm not an employee, but in the sense that you know they're going to do the work, and you're not necessarily like watching how many hours they're playing Tetris while they're while they're while they're doing doing their work. Um, with with uh, university press clients, um, I'm a little like Derek and and, and Aaron, and, and in terms of, of you quote them a number, and sometimes it's low and sometimes it's high, and it just it averages out, and you just build that into how it, how it works. I do have an hourly rate in my head when I'm thinking how many hours would that take. Well, using my standard hourly rate, how much would that be? Um, and sometimes I'm right, and sometimes I'm wrong, and it's okay because it's fun fun work. Um, when I'm building a, a larger client, a larger project for a new client, uh, it takes more care, and I I assume that there's going to be some back and forth, and I make it clear to the client that you know here's a ballpark. Let's get more detail. Uh, and it's not until I get a really solid set of specs that I give them a really solid number. Um, I have a tourism client I'm working with now who it took uh, a couple letters and a meeting and some, and then I needed, I needed to outsource some of it, so I got to get a quote for that outsourced element. Um, and the clients generally are, I have, have been appreciative when they can see transparently that I'm trying to get it right. Uh, for them, they say, well, okay, I have a quote, but I'm missing this piece, and I want this piece to be really good for you, so hang on just a second. Um, or I'll leave this open-ended, and here's a range of possibilities of what it might be. Um, that, I mean, you have, to, you have to gauge based on the client's situation. Some clients are like, I'm, I'm, I have another client that is, is a pass-through client, and they, don't, they want a number because they have to deal with their client and give a number to them and they're, they're like this a little bit. So uh, it, it's a psychology, a lot of it is just judging the psychology of, of the situation. Is, 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 your, is your person the person, the, the decision maker? If they are, then you have a little more flexibility to, to talk with them. If they're not the decision maker and their hands are tied, you know, be kind. <laughs> And I think also, yeah, dealing, like knowing what people you're dealing with, if you can tell right up front, this person's going to email a lot, they're going to call me a lot, they're gonna, like, <laughs> you have to really think about the time that you spend emailing, talking, thinking about these projects and include that in the estimate for the project. And yeah. then there are, you know, you can just tell up front the ones that are going to be very simple, hands off. So I think a lot of people when they start just think about how many hours will it take me to design the map and they don't think about all of the other time it takes to do that extra stuff, the cost of their software, the cost of the computer. You know, you have to really think about everything that goes into it and build that into your price, which makes it, you know, a little more tricky whenever you're first starting. And then I, I, I wasn't in charge. I wasn't in charge of billing when I was at Hedberg Maps in charge of billing or, or charging. But one of the things I observed by looking is that you always have a nut. You start with for, with like a per project, you know, X hundred dollars to do all the initial interviewing and the post billing and the nagging for following up on the billing and uh, all the all the stuff that isn't actually doing the work you just you, you build some nut into the project of cost one more comment I wanted to make sure and share on pricing is the whole uh, idea or philosophy of perceived quality uh, we've had a lot of clients in the past who didn't hire us um, and they didn't hire us because we, they didn't think we charged enough. Mm. They didn't think we were good enough, or they didn't think we thought we were good enough for a job. I, I, I probably, especially with the live stream, I probably shouldn't name any specific company names, but I'll just be a little cloak and dagger and say we had a client, an, an ad agency one time, who was calling on behalf of a Fortune 500 company wanting some uh, bird's eye oblique pictorial illustrations made for an ad campaign that would have appeared in print, TV ads, etc. And they said, what would you charge? And I said, well, ad agency, Fortune 500 company, I'm gonna double our prices because I, number one, I think they can afford it. <laughs> number two, I know this is gonna be a high stress job. And number three, they probably are used to dealing with folks who charge a lot more than we do for our work. I submitted our estimate, fingers crossed. I hope I wasn't greedy and quoting too much. And the next day, the ad agency called me back and said, uh, we love your work, but we could never work with you because unless you could charge at least three times what you're quoting us, our client would never take you seriously. <laughs> Basically what they were telling us is unless, <laughs> unless we charge six times our normal fees for the work, we couldn't be hired for, for the job. 
and that was all about perceived quality. Uh, and we didn't think we were worth it, so why should they think we are worth it? And we, we have a, a lot of other projects in different regions of the world where the same thing applies. They don't necessarily care what the price is. They want to know that you understand the project. They want to know that you think that you can pull it off, and they want to feel like and be able to kind of puff, up, puff out their chest and brag to their other people that they're working with that we hired the best. If we don't charge enough, if we don't think we're worth it, we're never gonna get those jobs. And it's a different mindset because everybody always thinks about pricing thinking, well, I have to be cheaper, I have to be the least costly, otherwise I'm never gonna get hired. A lot of times for those types of projects, the exact opposite is true. And I know that's hard for us to get used to, but I've, I, the more I've been in business, the more I've encountered situations like that where if you're cheapest, you're attracting a certain type of client uh, who may not appreciate your work and want everything done for nickels and dimes mm -hmm. versus getting good projects where they're good paying, but they expect to be able to say, I am hiring one of the best and I am paying for one of the best. So just something to keep in mind related to pricing. I want to mention two little things uh, related to pricing. Uh, one, uh, I don't know, perhaps because I grew up poor, I'm still very shy about uh, 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 naming a price that sounds high to me. And uh, so one phrase that I have finally uh, discovered that uh, is helpful to me in at least writing the email, I don't know about uh, people reading the email, is I'll say, uh, I think $400 is a fair price for this scope of work. And because who can object to the phrase fair, right? Uh, <laughs> if you say it's fair, well, it must be the thing. Uh, so then on a completely different tack, uh, I have some clients, uh, they're uh, hotels that want custom maps. And the, the front desk guys, they're just not used to the idea of paying for uh, somebody to do artwork and then also paying for a product to be delivered to the hotel. And so I have discovered uh, printers that give me uh, just excellent, excellent prices on these, enough that I can just mark them up double. And uh, then I say, well, I, you know, I don't actually charge you anything for drawing your map. Uh, here's the price for 5,000 of those delivered to your desk. And then when they run out six months later and order another 5,000, well, it's the exact same price. And so now I've made money on the job. Mm -hmm. And they're happy because they can see it as a per unit uh, price mm -hmm. instead of uh, being in what is to them uncharted territory of hiring professional services at an hourly rate and then bidding for printing on top of it. So. so I actually was in a small business for about nine months, uh, about two years out of college. Um, a friend of mine and I started a writing and, and design uh, company, and it, it, we started on our credit, on our post-college credit cards, and it lasted nine months before we uh, started drowning. Um, and one of the pieces that I, I took away from that is how important it is to. Um, know the business that you're in, know the, the, the industry that you're in before you go freelance. Um, and I think part of that is knowing the pricing culture. And one, one of the things I've, I'm hearing here is that, and it's true that if you're working with ad, ad agencies, there is an entirely different pricing culture to working with university presses. And it's an entirely different pricing culture from working with people who are used, used to free, free flyers uh, showing up on their doorstep. Um, and knowing, uh, I mean, not just n knowing uh, in abstract, but having lived in that culture and knowing how to how to mas how to how to massage the, the the situation so that you actually get paid what you want to get paid. Uh, it, b working in retail is different. If you're trying to sell a product, uh, and there there are different retail there. There's the bookstore retail pricing model, and there's the gift shop retail pricing model, and there's the the selling it on the internet to individuals retail pricing model. And each of them has their own kind of culture about how you how you price yourself and how you sell that price and how you how you do that um, and knowing that from the inside from having worked it one way or the other I mean you can do it yourself and just learn from experience over time um, but one of the advantages to uh, f starting freelance in an industry that you've already worked as an employee and part of a company that already has someone who's figured that out for you uh, you, you can learn from that 
uh, and it's a useful useful thing. And I think people don't always think about when they're starting a, their own small business. I think I want to backpedal a little bit to a comment that Aaron made earlier about uh, clients who take up a lot of time. Uh, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you fire clients? Do you hmm. not work with them anymore? Do you have the liberty to do that? Without you, you don't need to name names, by the way. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, I've never fired a difficult client. I, I, I feel like I, I have a commitment. I need to finish the project, but yeah, I, they t it's, it's a tough one. You know, I, I think at some point, if they are demanding a lot of time and, you know, we're into, like, it might be a simple map or a simple series of maps, and I'd say on average I go through about three, maybe four drafts before they find a final copy. There might be eight, nine, ten drafts, and at a certain point, in a kind manner, I will say, um, instead of making small changes here and small changes there, take a week, like take some time to really look at this and you know, then come back to me with like a good concise set of changes. I feel like that's what it usually is with the difficult ones, is just you know, adding more and more and more and more and changing it. So I try to kind of, you know, I think they want to rush, they want to like get the map done fast, but then it ends up drawing it out even more. So I encourage them to take some time think about it, and then get back to me with a concise set of changes. But yeah, never fired anyone for <laughs> difficult. Yes. One of the maps I, I drew, my client was a lawyer. I'm not sure if it's on. One of my, one of my clients on? was okay. a lawyer. So very legal language. And the way I realized to work best with her was to try and figure out her language and talk back to her in her language. She wanted to own the copyright to the finished product. And she thought that was fair, so I couldn't reproduce it. I didn't need to reproduce it, but when I researched it, if I had given her the copyright, I could not create anything similar again. She would own the copyright to my work. And when I explained it to her that way, she went, oh, obviously that makes sense, and we just did a letter of agreement that I wouldn't make reproductions. So sometimes that difficult client is actually, we're just having a communication issue. Mm -hmm. So learning their language really helped me. Mm -hmm. I don't recall ever firing a client. I did very early on um, have someone who was so difficult that I actually put a, a, a line item at the bottom of their invoice, uh, an extra uh, uh, extra hundred fifty dollars for working with such and such employee of theirs. Um, <laughs> didn't didn't really ever expect to get, to see that uh, uh, paid, and, uh, and, and and of course never heard from that client again, which was was just fine with me. So, uh, did they pay? As I recall, they paid the base amount, but not the surcharge. <laughs> um, there's, I, I, I'm not sure, how, I'm familiar with the term, the PITA charge, the P-I-T-A charge, pain in the ass charge, uh, <laughs> which the second time you work with a client who's been a pain in the first time, you just, you add on the extra percentage mm -hmm. for, for working with them, and if they pay it, okay, you're being paid for what you think it's worth to, to deal with them. Um, <laughs> I routinely have a clause in my agreements that, that specifies the number of revisions, and any revisions beyond this is work beyond the scope, and we'll be build an addition at an hourly rate. Um, that's just a standard standard clause, and uh, especially with clients who uh, sound like they don't know the process and haven't been through the process, and who there might be things, it's important to put that in there so that they know two rounds of revisions and two rounds of revisions. Plus, when your copy editor gets back back to you, you, you get a free round in six months when it's when it's coming back through. That's my standard for university press work. Mm -hmm. um, and you can you can massage that in terms of what you think the process will be. I, I actually like it, and I think clients like it to have it really clearly spelled out uh, for a more complex job. That okay, I'm going to send you an area of coverage. You're going to approve that. I'm going to send you a style sheet. You're going to approve that. You're going to send me a complete list of everything you want on the map, and anything and anything that deviates from this that, from this plan. Then you can say, "Look, here's what the agreement said. You've now doubled the number of points three months after the fact. I'm going to try." And those like, "Okay, yeah, that that usually." And if or they'll say, "Oh, I guess we can't do that then because it's not in our budget, and we'd have to spend six months getting the budget approved for that extra two hundred dollars." Um, and sometimes you can just absorb it, but then you get look good for being nice for having 
not charge them for a thing that you uh, that, that they uh, otherwise would have been charged for. I was just going to jokingly add, we don't call it a PETA tax. We always call it a hassle tax. And the client would never see that because, again, we're not quoting hourly rates. We're basically quoting a, you know, here's the dollar amount to complete the project. Uh, but you can bet there's certain clients where we're building in extra fees because we know it's going to be painful working with them. And to the original question about have we ever fired a client, we've fired several clients over the last 18 years, but never in the middle of a job. We'll always finish the job, but then we'll just conveniently not be available for any more work for that client. Or sometimes we'll have to outright tell them, I'm sorry, we just, I don't think we're going to be able to service your needs in the future. Um, but we'll always finish the job in process. We've never bailed on a job midway through. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the pain in the ass charge is part of the reason why, the, why pricing cultures are different in different places. One, one of the reasons ad agencies charge, one of the reasons you can charge ad agencies so much more is they assume that you're going to have to do the project three times because they're, because they're, you have to do it once for your satisfaction, once for the agency's satisfaction, and then once for the client's satisfaction. And that's just, that's how the culture works and that's, that, that they work that way, so why shouldn't you? And that's why it costs so much more. And so talking about clients in a happier fashion, uh, how do you find new ones? I actually took notes last night. I was going back to my emails from 10 years ago trying to remember how I got started. So, Somebody is, prepared for yes, this. Wow. I, I did. <laughs> um, yeah, so in my intro, I didn't really say what I did at my previous job. So at MapQuest, I did textbook publishing. So I developed skills doing that kind of work at Penn State. I was the sole cartographer in the geography department. I did a lot of work for Penn State Press while I was there, but being by myself, it was almost like I was operating like a freelancer would, but in the safety of the geography department. And so when I went off on my own, I, I did manage to take my Penn State Press jobs with me because when I left, the, um, my job, you know, the, the position wasn't filled. And so that's one way I got a new client was taking one that I'd worked with previously. Um, I wrote here cardotalk.com which isn't used so much anymore, but um, in 2008, Damian Sanders put a call out there for the Earth Atlas, which a lot of cartographers worked on. I happened to be looking at that website the right day. I emailed him. I got that job. Um, and then another was a previous MapQuest um, employee that I worked with. And my first client that actually found me through my website was a year after I put the website out. And so it was like a, a you know a combination of networking, um, me being in the right place at the right time, and people finding me because of my portfolio. And I still find that it's a mix of that. I'll get the random um, form filled out from my website, just somebody doing a Google search for freelance cartographer, scholarly publishing. Um, a lot of it's word of mouth from like you know an author that I worked with might talk to their colleague in their department and refer me. Um, and you know, a lot of contacts that I've made here at NASIS will, will share with me. If they can't handle a project, I might um, get it from them. So kind of a combination of all those. I think for me, kind of one of the, the most successful things we've done to grow our client base over the years is professional associations and trade shows. Mm -hmm. uh, targeting very specific, well-defined, well-researched, where I've spent a lot of time researching what these organizations are about, who their membership is. Are they the decision makers? Are they the champions in their organization? Who are these people who are attending these events? And how are they consuming the services that we produce? By far, I think we've grown our client base uh, Leap by leaps and bounds through professional association uh, memberships and conference attendance or trade shows. And I try and my, my strategy, and I'm highly over, uh, over generalizing, so I apologize, but my strategy my entire life when it comes to marketing and sales is when everybody else is zigging, I zag. Like if everybody, if the herd is running this direction, I go the other direction. And what I love to do is I love to put myself in situations or places where I am the only one selling these services in a group. If there's 20 other people selling map illustration services in the room, I'm just part of that noise. 
versus if I'm the only one in that association selling map illustration services, you get known after years as you're the mapping guy. So whenever that organization then needs maps in the future, who are they gonna call? The one person they know who makes maps or sells maps for a living. Um, another thing I do uh, pretty heavily is market research. Uh, I spend a lot of time, an unhealthy amount of time in Google Analytics um, <laughs> because I want to track and see who's looking at our content, who's looking at different types of illustration, uh, illustrations in our portfolio on our website. And then what I always do, the last thing I do every day before I shut off my computer at work is I see who's been on our site in the previous 24 hours. The first thing I do the next day when I turn my computer on is if I see there's different organizations who are crushing different parts of our online portfolio looking at particular types of maps is I'll contact individuals, not just dear sir, madam, I'll contact specific individuals in those organizations and say, you know, hey, just wanted to introduce our company, you know, here's the types of illustration services we have, share a few portfolio examples that just happen to align with the types of maps that they were looking at the day before on our website. Uh, and say, if you ever need, if you're ever interested in map illustration services, if there's ever anything we could do to be of assistance, let me know. And then I get a reply back and or a call back and say, wow, you guys must be like psychic. I was just on your website yesterday. Uh, and how, you know, what, you know, this is serendipitous, like we, you know, we're, we're destined to work together. And I'm just like, well, not really. I was just you looking at our analytics and saw that someone in your organization happened to be looking at our portfolio pretty heavily. And knowing over 18 years, these are the types of individuals or departments who tend to look at our work from various types of organizations. I took a flyer and said, well, this must be the person who's, who was interested within that organization. And we get a ton, ton, ton of work that way. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, word of mouth referrals for us are huge. Since the very first projects I've ever done, uh, our business has grown via word of mouth referrals. And client relations, client services is everything, keeping those clients happy. Like firing a client tends to be the nuclear option because you're not just losing that one client, you're losing all of the people they might have referred to you for similar types of products. So when I started, uh, I was coming out of the city planning world and for a number of years I had um, been the guy at their annual conference who gave the talk on how to improve your maps, how to make better maps. And so here I am off on my own. Everybody knows Dennis, he's the planning map guy. I thought I was sure to get work from that world. Never gotten a thing out of the city planning world. Um, but instead, through various professional circles that I it was uh, running in urbanism or tra local transit uh, issues in Chicago, uh, just happened uh, to talk with people who when they uh, said, you know what, we really need some maps for this project. They said, wait, I just met a guy the other day, what was his name? And, and so anyway, yeah, being the only map maker they've ever met uh, is one of, the, uh, one of the ways that I got a lot of work, in, uh, especially in the early days. And that kind of local networking, I think, is still perhaps the most valuable. For a while, I belonged to a, a, a local real estate uh, organization, now Lambda Alpha Land Economics. Uh, but um, somehow that, the networking there never really paid off. And so, you know, when they raised their dues a, a third time to assist the uh, young students, I said, well, I, <laughs> some of those young students are making more per year than I am now. And so I, I need to drop this uh, thing. NASIS, of course, has a list of custom card firms on its website. I know that uh, things have come in over the transom that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly wish there were a way, like the Dear Departed Car uh, Cardo Talk, uh, to know that the organization that contacted me yesterday uh, from uh, you know, this Israeli tourism client is actually just going down the list of everybody on the NASIS website and uh, that would give me some valuable information about where to quote the job or whether to quote the job, how much time to spend quoting the job. Um, that list is alphabetic, by the way. So, you know, if you want to start your own new business, I would recommend something <laughs> starting with a couple of A's, just to make yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I did the Chicago Transit Authority map for many years and now do the regional transit map in Chicago, occasionally I get contacted by procurement agencies in, uh, for other big transit agencies. Um, 
I'm no longer terribly optimistic about those because uh, what I've concluded after doing a lot of those proposals through the years is most of these agencies, the procurement officer just wants to be able to say in their to their boss, yes, I managed to get 10 different firms to, uh, to bid on the job, mm -hmm. but then they're really going to go with one of the two national transit mapping firms because nobody ever got fired for hiring, you know, for buying IBM, we used to say in the old days, and nobody ever gets fired from a transit procurement job for hiring either CHK America or Smart Maps out of Knoxville. Uh, Chicago Cartographics, the one guy, eh, he's way down on the list and Fort Worth is just probably not going to end up going with him, so it's not worth my time to uh, spend several days preparing that proposal. Uh, one thing that's proven very valuable through the years, awfully basic, put your name on the side of the map so that if somebody likes it, they can figure out how to get in touch with you. And when I started my firm, I joked that I named it Chicago Cartographics because in those pre-Google days, uh, if they couldn't figure out what city's directory assistants to call to get the number for Chicago Cartographics, I was not going to be very happy working with them as a client. Uh, certainly word of mouth, very good. Uh, I've recently been kind of tiptoeing into some direct mail efforts, uh, trying to uh, let real estate companies know, oh, we had, I, you know, I've got, I put something in a file the other day, uh, maybe I can find that piece, uh, that direct mail piece again, uh, somebody that actually does custom, custom maps. If you're not a, um I'm not sure whether to call Derek, Derek a natural marketer, but but I think you you have a you have a, a marketing streak in you and a sales streak in you. If you're not someone who does that, um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the pieces of advice I give to people who say I want to start a map business, is find the specialty that is something that you already love. Get known in that community as a person who makes maps in that specialty. It can be a local specialty. It can be a, a, a a recreational specialty, it can be a thematic uh, subject matter specialty. Um, and the re one of the reasons to do that, I think, is that if you hate marketing, you're going to go to two conventions, not make any sales, and give up, because it's you just hate doing that work. Um, Whereas if you're going to a convention for something you actually really enjoy, it's like, well, I didn't make any sales, but I had you know five hours of lovely chats to people about pet rocks, and it was great. It was that one. Um, because I think one of the one of the key things of, of getting clients is wait. It takes a it takes surprisingly long. I mean, I I had been working for 22 years in the industry when I went freelance, and it was a solid two years before I was earning anything like a full time income doing the work when I went freelance. Uh, and that includes having freelance work for my <laughs> previous employer. I had the advantage of, of, you know, I didn't cut all links and throw that away. I was like, getting a substantial amount of work from Hedberg Maps. Um, it takes a long time to build up. Some of it is just, um, it takes time to build a network. And some of it is also your network has time to find a project that they want to hire you for. Um, I mean, I've, I've gotten a fair, number, a fair amount of work through people I've known at Mesa's for, for decades now. But it took a long time before, like, oh, now, a year and a half later, now I'm at this other job, I actually have a thing. I, let me hire Nat to do this, this thing. And, that was, and that's been, been great. Um, a, one thing that people haven't mentioned is freelance websites. Um, uh, Upwork, freelancer.com, guru.com, there's a bunch of other, other places out there. I've mostly gotten work through Upwork. It's lower paying than you'll get from uh, real clients, um, mostly. And 99% of it is people looking for third world contractors willing to work for $2 an hour. But in amongst those are people who are genuinely looking for good quality work. And if you present yourself as someone who can actually solve their problem and actually knows, you know, the people who go to, go to Upwork to solve it are people who don't know, already know someone who can do the work. They're like, I need a map. What do I do? I'll go on Upwork and, 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 and ask. Um, and so if you're willing to put the, the time in to, to you know, write at ease and saying, well, here's the problem, and here's what I see your problem is, and here's how I might be able to solve it, and come across as the, God, the first intelligent person who's actually replied to this thing, um, 
I've actually gotten some decent work out of there. You have to, you have to put out 20 different applications to get one byte, and you have to accept that they're going to, you're going to get less pay for it than you would for a non-freelancer site. But it's not a terrible source of source of uh, clients. Otherwise, everything else that everyone says. Is um, another question, um, one a bit on morality. So imagine you've just produced map for client A, and you've charged them $1,000. And then a week later, client B comes along and wants either essentially exactly the same map or map of the same region so that you could use a lot of map A for that map. Do you charge client B the same amount, or are you going to be fair? How do you handle those situations? Yes. <laughs> you, yeah. You, you charge the same as if you had just designed it. I mean, this happens a lot in university publishing. There's a lot of research topics that will, you know, you'll get three people in one year that want a Civil War map because it's the anniversary of the Civil War. Like, I, you'll tweak the style. You're still doing work on it, but definitely bill in those hours that it took to, to do that. Yeah. I got to say that I once had a client who was willing to pay me twice for the same map. He contacted me a couple months ago, said, oh, can you make me a map of this and this? And I'm like, do you mean this map I made for you seven years ago? <laughs> All right, that's uh, the one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't charge him double, though. I'm, I'm too honest for that. <laughs> uh, even before I started, I talked to someone who told me, um, you, you don't make money the first time you draw the map. And um, I found that to be a fairly re re reliable uh, rule of thumb. So yeah, my maps of downtown Chicago, I have sold over and over and over again to different clients and uh, don't feel bad uh, uh, doing it because it is solving their problem for them. Uh, uh, so wh why, sh why, am I, why shouldn't I profit? Uh, but uh, I'm obviously not charging them the full cost of drawing the entire map of downtown Chicago. Uh, so it all comes out uh, pretty well in the end. I had a more interesting situation a number of years ago where um, I was doing a lot of work for a particular uh, commercial real estate broker firm. And a couple of their agents had decided to start their own firm and we're now going after the very same work that my bread and butter client was doing and um, asked me to also prepare the maps for their investment offering uh, proposal. And so uh, after pondering this for a while, I went and talked to the bread and butter client and said, look, we've been asked to do some for a competing firm. And uh, I deliberately kind of tried to obscure who this competing firm was. I wasn't totally successful, I don't think. Uh, but then I also had to take some care as we were doing the work for these two clients to not use the information that one had provided us to inform the maps that I was preparing for the other. So the kind of thing that big law firms sometimes have to do, of uh, they call it building a Chinese wall uh, between different parts of the the organization so that you cannot <laughs> use the information, you, you, you know, uh, to work against yourself. Okay. Um, I think how you structure your, your this is a, 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 again sort of a root of how you structure your business. When I worked for Hedberg Maps, uh, much like Dennis, we had, we were building, part of our business was building map, base that, map bases that we could then reuse over and over again. Um, I'm finding that more and more I'm just using natural earth for a lot of my work or I'm using, uh, you know, just going for a fresh um, um, tiger or, or DOT street map grid when I'm doing a piece. So there isn't the investment in map bases um, that I had 20 years ago. Um, and so the question doesn't, doesn't really matter. I think it's fine to resell your knowledge of a particular area. If you've done a map of Cleveland and now you actually know where the parts of Cleveland are and you don't have to look it up, uh, there's no shame in, in using that as part of your part of your expertise. Um, yeah, I, 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 but I think being clear about what your business model is and what you're selling, uh, there's also the difference of are you retaining rights to your to your map or are you selling everything to the client, and those are two different business models. Uh, I think one is being more, more a publisher's model where you're retaining rights and you're selling uh, rights to use it versus 
uh, you're just you're making the map from them. They own it now, and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, both have value. Uh, both clients will perceive value in, in, in either one of them, and it's just a question of which works better as a uh, as a long-term business model. All right, we're uh, getting close to the end of this session. Um, are there any questions from the audience at this point? Hey, I was hoping you guys could talk about whether or not you use contracts with your clients prior to starting working with them, if and when you do that, and what is included in the contracts that you usually give your clients. A lot of times, if it's a bigger company, they'll supply a contract to me first, um, and I'll, you know, I'll review it. If I agree, it, I'll sign it, and that's the one I'll work with. And I mean. Ten years ago when I got started, I had a lawyer friend tell me that basically if they agree to something in an email, that's as good as a contract. So if they say, we'll pay you money, and I say, I'll have it to you by this time, this is what I'll deliver, he said there's really no need for an official contract, that if I would have to take them to small claims court for non-paying, I could just print out the email and that would be enough. So I tend not to have a contract, but I am very clear with my emails. I kind of go the other way where we <laughs> always have a paper trail. Um, even if we have the emails, I'll still put together a basic agreement, and I'm usually the one who prepares it uh, rather than the client supplying me mm -hmm. with something. But I always tease and say no Latin, no legalese. It's usually no more than two pages, and it's very plain English, common sense type stuff, just saying what we're going to be doing, when we're going to be doing it, what the client is agreeing to pay, when the client is agreeing to pay, you know, like uh, if there's any problems in the process, what happens as far as mitigating those problems, et cetera, but it's very kind of simple, straightforward language because, again, keep it simple for the client. The client doesn't want to have to hire somebody to have to, you know, get out a Latin dictionary and try and translate some of the terms. I mean, it's keep it simple. Uh, basic, just kind of the, the main points that you need to have documented in case things go south on a job. But it's always good to have a paper trail. Um, the challenge is if you're doing a project for $500 or $1,000, are you going to spend $2,500 in attorney fees to collect the $500 on the job? No. <laughs> so you have to kind of take some of that into mind as well uh, when you're doing this. And that's where the, the, the more efficiently, the more cleanly, the quick, more quickly you can prepare those types of documents, the better it is for you, if that answers the question. Oddly enough, though, I am a lawyer. Uh, no, I, I hardly ever, uh, I, I don't uh, ask for a contract. Occasionally, the clients, uh, public agencies, will uh, have something that I do have to sign. Uh, and there have been some special circumstances uh, where I would prepare a, a very brief agreement uh, for someone that, that wanted uh, to know for sure about something. One that uh, was kind of interesting, I was doing a tourism uh, guide to St. Louis uh, like every six months, and, uh, and this particular client wanted to be assured that if I got hit by a bus, someone else would get the files to be able to continue publishing this for them. And uh, so I actually wrote up, uh, you know, a, a real very simple agreement about uh, about this, and for a while just kept a CD of the current files at my sister's house in Texas, just in case. <laughs> uh, depends in part on the size of the client and the size of the project. Um, the size of the client, because if you're dealing with a big organization, you don't know if the person you're dealing with is the person you're going to be dealing with next month, uh, and you still have the project in place. So it's good to have everything specified. Uh, size of the pro uh, size of the project because if you're putting in twenty thousand dollars worth of work, you want to have things a little more nailed down in case there's some some trouble down the line. Um, uh, rights, I have a clause about rights, who owns them, and and when, and and a clause saying that I own the copyright until I'm paid in full. That's a that's a really useful clause to include. Mm -hmm. uh, terms, uh, when is when is payment due? I say do, do payment on delivery. You know, thirty days is what usually ends up happening, but that's good. Uh, adjudication. If there's a legal problem, do we solve this in in Guam or do we solve this here in Minnesota? Um, and usually the, the contract, I, I find especially for, for large, for even medium-sized projects, the contract is a really useful way of simply outlining the specs of what you're doing. 
by just getting in one place, I'm going to make you three maps. They cover this area, they have this content, and this is the process, and this is the time of delivery. Here are the forms of delivery. I'm giving you a PDF and an EPS. That kind of, of specs, getting it all in one place on one piece of paper, um, is often clarifying as much for the client as for me. Just here, here's what here's what it says. You're signing off on it. That means you're agreeing to it, and you don't get to say, "Oh, I didn't know that you were." Later, later on, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't do it for every project. I'd say if, if it's under five hundred dollars, I don't I don't worry about it, uh, as, uh, unless it's for a client that is large and uh, requires one. I was just going to quickly add to uh, Dennis's hit by a bus clause, quote unquote. That actually has been something that has been kind of one of our a secret sauce to our success in our shop as well, because having a one person shop, you do run that risk. What if you're hit by a bus? What if you're sick? What if you can't work for two months? Uh, so our shop, we've tried to grow our, our network of roughly a dozen illustrators so that we have interchangeable parts. Derek is hit by a bus. Someone else can pick up his work and carry on for the client, and a lot of clients are looking for that safety or security, that strength in numbers. So if you can partner with another cartographer or two, the clients feel a little safer about that until they get to know you. Once they're working with you and they know you, it's not as much of an issue, but getting that first contract with a client, they like that kind of that added safety or security, at least in my experience. I think there was one more question. So uh, I've got a small client set, it's not enough to go full time yet, but I kind of wanted to ask if you guys have any experience uh, releasing your own products. Because if, if I were to go off on my own, I, w I would like that to be part of it. I've been experimenting with some things in the App Store, some other pieces uh, have generated some, interested, some interest in possibly licensing them for other products. Just wanted to see if you guys have any experience making that a part of what you offer. Good luck. <laughs> I've, I've done a bit of that, and I've found that um, producing a, a good map is one thing. Marketing it is a completely different thing. And yeah. I, I, I'd like to think I've made good maps, but I'm really bad at marketing. So they haven't sold out at all. Of course, I started in the folded paper map era, but it was quickly apparent to me that uh, the sales were not related to how good a map it was, it was related to how good or big a sales force you had out there putting stuff in racks. So I, I always kind of stayed out of that. There are people who often are at NASIS with, uh, who could talk much more about that. Um, uh, Tom Harrison and um, Mike, Herman. Mike Herman, Purple yeah. Lizard Maps, uh, have taken this jump and you know had some modest success, I guess Tom Harrison more than modest, uh, success at actually publishing products, but you know that's a different, whole different uh, mm -hmm. ball of fish or kettle of wax or whatever it is that. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of work with Mike Herman on the purple lizard maps, and right now I do a lot of the map publisher illustrator work. I'm at the computer. He's the one out there talking to land managers. He's putting the maps in the stores. I think he's got that personality, you know, he can go out there and encourage people, you need to have this hiking map in your store, of course, and, and I, I know that I don't have that. I'm much better at doing all of the data work on my computer, so I think having a team like that works well that, you know, I have a service for him and he can go out and sell the map. So. Every, every type of map in, that, in a variety of different ways has a different market that, was, that, that, that will work for it. Are you selling, I mean, Mike Herman, his maps are of a very specific geographic geographic area. He has a limited number of shops he's going to sell it, sell them in, and he has a really good relationship with enough of the shops. Uh, there's, the recreational maps often have this quality. Tom Harrison does the same thing. If you're selling a map of, an, of one particular area, there may be five stores that you're going to sell it in, that you're going to sell 90% of your, of your titles in. Uh, other titles are sold thematically. If you're, if, you know, if you're making a map of um, uh, what, whatever, whatever industry, uh, knowing the industry association, knowing what magazines to sell it in or what websites, uh, having a good web thing that targets that and works with that particular audience is, is really useful. If you're trying to just sell a map generally, that whole market is basically dried up. If, you know, you're selling a map that goes into a thousand stores, uh, good luck um, with that. So knowing, knowing the industry from the inside of the industry, and if you don't know it, finding someone who does. 
uh, often with a totally non-MAP related product. How do you sell into this kind of store? How do you sell into this industry? Who's already selling into the industry? How do you partner with them? Um, I know that, for example, for museum uh, people who sell educational sort of stuff, um, there's, a, there's a small number of people who sell into museum shops. Um, and that, that, is a, that is a business and an industry in, in and of itself. So that, that would be my advice is, is to do, not assume that just because you know the subject area um, that you know how to sell into it. It's, it's, it's both, this, both the cultural part and also the mechanics of it of, well, if I sell this to this thing, then I have to sell through a wholesaler who takes this discount, and so I have to price it this way, otherwise I'm not going to make enough money. But I also have to pay taxes, and that, there's, there's, especially in the internet era, there's enough moving parts that you have to kind of know what they are and where they're located, um, that it helps to have someone who already knows those parts. All right, I think that's about all that we have time for today. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, sharing their wisdom. I'd like to thank everybody here for, uh, for being here. Uh, and I would like to remind you that there's still t-shirts available. <laughs> and there's still a couple of places available for Jeopardy. So if you really want to get heckled tonight, go for it. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to our panelists.